Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 162, Deadly Harpoon. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong in a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jacket officer. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the Baker Street Irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And boy, are we stuck on an episode today. Uh, we are delighted to welcome back a two-timer uh, to the program, uh, the editor of the latest volume from the BSI Press, Deadly Harpoon, Mr. Glenn Maranker. We'll be getting to Glenn in just a moment. Before we do that, uh, we thought that, uh, well, we could tell you a little bit about uh, how to get in touch with us. Because at the end of the show, uh, or toward the end of the show, we're going to have some featured voicemails. You know, we often talk about calling in to the show here at 774-221-READ. That's 774-221-7323. Uh, that is one of the many ways that we allow you to uh, give your feedback to the show. You know, you can certainly tweet us and hit us up on our Facebook page and send us an email at comment at I hear of Sherlock dot com. But it's it's really the most personal when we get voicemails from you. And we realize that it's not everyone's thing to pick up the phone and call us, even though you've picked up the phone perhaps to listen to us. Uh, and we realize that podcasting tends to be a one-way broadcast mechanism, but this is our way of really making it more conversational. So uh, stay tuned at the end of the program to hear from a couple of the folks that have dialed 774-221-READ. And uh, if you are so inclined, you can add your voice to the mix as well. Yes, you know, and you need to really appreciate some of the technology, some of the work. I mean, you said... Uh, just a bit oddly that people pick up the phone to listen to us. They don't, <laughs> they don't really do that. But, but one of the things that's really interesting is what goes on behind the scenes to capture all this. You know, you might think that it's an ordinary voicemail system, but it's not. We have trained a small group of parrots who have the ability to mimic <laughs> human speech and who have fabulous memories. And so when your calls come in, one of these birds will actually listen to them and then repeat back what you say in a pitch perfect fashion live right here on uh, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Reminds me of some of those early Flintstones episodes where, you know, the, the bird's bill would be used as the needle for the phonograph. Uh, and, and then uh, after being subjected to some abuse by Fred, the bird would break the fourth plane and make some remark to the audience. You know, Fred Flintstone was really underrated as an innovator. You know, <laughs> years ago, I even gave up the whole idea of Teslas or, uh, or uh, electric cars or a Toyota Prius. I, you know, I just stick my feet through the floorboards and pound away. It works great. Well, when you've had a car long enough and you've had enough potholes like we do this winter, uh, it's inevitable. <laughs> well, uh, why don't we get to what everyone is here for, and that is our lauded guest. Well, we are pleased to welcome Glenn Maranker back to the program. You may remember Glenn having been on a couple of other times. He was with us 
in episode 79 where he talked about oh, just the art of collecting as a Sherlockian overall. And then he was uh, with us again in episode 133 where we talked specifically about Dan Poznanski's collection that went up for auction uh, about a year, a little over a year ago. And uh, Glenn helped to catalog some of that. Uh, Glenn's investiture in the Baker Street Irregulars is the origin of tree wor- worship. Uh, he is retired from Apple Computer, where he was Apple's chief technology officer of hardware, and he lives in San Francisco. And to have seen Glenn's collection, as as I have, is uh, it should be on everyone's bucket list. Uh, it includes first editions, manuscripts, original artwork, association copies, ephemera, recordings, canonical writings, pirated editions. It's the definitive collection of Charlie McCarthy as Sherlock Teaspoons. I mean, who else can say that? And a notebook where Arthur Conan Doyle scribbled the words, Killed Holmes. And it's a pleasure to welcome Glenn back to the program. Glenn, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Good day, gentlemen. I'm always pleased to have a conversation with you guys. Well, you may feel differently after we're done here. Who knows? So, Glenn, we have the BSI Press uh, latest edition, Deadly Harpoon, uh, in front of us. And you, of course, are the editor there. How would you describe this book to the average reader? Well, uh, I mean, fundamentally, what this book is is a uh, facsimile with commentary of uh, one of the uh, adventures of Sherlock Holmes, the adventure of Black Peter. You know, it's one of the uh, smallish number of extant manuscripts. Um, And what I had in mind when we uh, talked about publishing the facsimile as, as part of the Baker Street Irregular Press manuscript series was uh, uh, having a collection of, of essays, of thoughts from some our, uh, any, uh, any number of our numerous experts on things that were uh, prominent in this particular story, and, and for most of them, at least prominent uh, in this story like no other. So, for example, a uh, fundamental part of the story uh, hinges on uh, some shares in the Canadian Pacific Railway. And I thought it would be interesting to find out what kind, what shares were, how they were traded, and so on, and, and that those sort of things. So I asked two of our esteemed colleagues from uh, Toronto to write about the Canadian Pacific Railway. Similarly, um, very important in this case is the consumption of alcohol, and in fact, misleading deductions by Stanley Hopkins based on. Um, uh, the remnants of some drinking that took place. And so, again, I thought that um, drinking, how it was associated with class, what might be expected, what someone with um, Sherlock's insight and acumen could be expected to be able to deduce uh, based on what was drunk and how it was drunk. And so there are a bunch of essays along these lines. There's, there's really a lot going on in this story. I think it was in... Uh in Wisteria Lodge where Inspector Bain says he thought he had squeezed it dry. And as we keep squeezing Black Peter here, I mean, it's certainly more than just a story about a harpoon. As you say, there's really a, a many different elements from not, not just, uh, you know, uh, seafaring uh, culture, but, but really from Victorian culture overall. Oh, I, you know, for sure. You know, something which uh, among the things I learned a great deal about, was having read Walter Jaffe's essay, it, it, it seemed, it, it, it just struck me in reading this book that, uh, this story, excuse me, that I had no appreciation for the, the size, the magnitude, the scope, the history of the British whaling and sealing industries. And, um, you know, how long were these voyages? Where did they go? How profitable were they? How numerous were they? And, and all, all these very elementary, if you'll pardon the expression, questions. And again, in, in this book is an essay by Mr. Jaffe, The History of the British Whaling and Sealing Industries. And um, wh- one of the reasons 
I think, for studying a manuscript is to try and better understand exactly what was going on in the writer's head, what sorts of knowledge he was exploiting, what sorts of events, situations, customs of the time that he was using to uh, infuse his story with uh, character, with interest, with with meaning, with coherence. And and so uh, I, I think things like understanding a little bit about whaling and sealing in, in Victorian times was an uh, important thing. Oh, yeah. I think that you center in on Walter, Captain Walter Jaffe's essay here because there's so much going on. And it really, as you say, it really does help unpack what was in the author's mind, particularly since, as we know, Conan Doyle experienced on a great whaling ship on the Hope. And that's one of the things that, that Jaffe refers to here, including <laughs> telling you, among other things, that the very first charter for whale exploration was granted to the Bishop of Chichester in 1148 by Pope Eugenius II. Now, I was sure that it was Eugenius I, but boy, you know, color me correct. And well, well, that's a, that's a, that's a common misconception that it was Eugenius II. <laughs> Uh, but, but, but to two scholars, uh, British whaling, we all know that it was Eugenia II. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the true nature of the first harpoons and, um, you know, the wonderful excerpts of Conan Doyle's experiences on the Hope. It really does add so much, you know, because without a book like this, you know, you would never know. I mean, Unless you're an enthusiast in this area, you would never really know that being on a whaling ship was such an important part of Conan Doyle's maturation. Well, to, absolutely. Um, not the least of which, you know, so to speak, that was his first job out of school. You know, went from, uh, you know, med school, uh, looking, for, you know, in his search for work, found uh, was answering an advertisement for a uh, ship's doctor. Went down to the docks and promptly got into an argument with one of the seamen and decked him. <laughs> As you know, the captain, the captain took one, one look at Conan Doyle, Dr. Conan Doyle and said, you'll do. <laughs> There's no, I've, I've, I've seen no stories that there was uh, any checking of Conan Doyle's uh, medical expertise, only, only that he was a, a, an accomplished boxer. Well, and they quickly found out after that voyage that he was an accomplished swimmer as well. Yeah, well, you know, it's something which um, uh, is doesn't figure quite so prominently in in this story, and so uh, I didn't look to uh, elaborate on it. But the role of of sports and physical exercise is you know, very important in, in the, and, and a continue a continuing thread, an omnipresent thread in a lot of the stories. And that certainly ref reflects uh, the uh, literary agent to uh, quite a degree. Many of us, you know, know the story about uh, when he visited Brudget Kipling in the United States up in Vermont. They, you know, went out and played around the golf in the in, in the snow, colored golf, you know, using red golf, some colored golf balls, and no doubt, Amer you know, Americans not having even ever seen golf thought there must be two madmen. Uh, <laughs> Uh, at least at the time, probably it, it, there's no doubt in my mind that it didn't occur to anybody that it was unusual to play it in the snow because they didn't know what the hell was going on. Right. So, yeah, these uh, these these physical attributes are uh, are also interesting and also um, inform uh, the stories. And it, this is probably a good opportunity for us to cross promote. Uh, if you listen to Trifles, which is our weekly podcast. Uh, you'll hear that uh, we have recently started a series there. Uh, every month we do one of our shows uh, on sports and games in the canon. So uh, as you say, Glenn, something that uh, comes up time and again throughout the stories. You know, as, as, as we look at this particular uh, story, obviously there's, there's quite a, a high degree of violence here. Uh, of uh, potential uh, spousal abuse, of, uh, of of alcoholism, there there seems to be kind of a, a very dark turn. Uh, you know how appropriate then that uh, you know the title would be Black Peter. What what do you think was 
was happening with Conan Doyle as either a, an individual or a storyteller at this time that he put something this dark together? That's a great question. The uh, it certainly is very dark, and the, and one of the things that particularly struck me, uh, as you mentioned, is domestic abuse. I I could only make the wildest speculation about why this was uh, particular was incorporated into the story. Women being taken advantage of is an off-repeated theme or sub-story in, in a, a goodly number of the uh, tales that have been brought to us by the literary agent. Hmm. Uh, but out-and-out domestic abuse is extraordinary. And Barbara Rush gives a, f- a fairly complete accounting uh, in her essay it, it, that's included in Deadly Harpoon about the violence and victims in, uh, of, of domestic abuse in, in the canon, in, in Victorian times in general and in the canon. And um, I would strongly urge folks who uh, are interested in getting some insight in, into this, this, this particular class of villainy, uh, take a look at her uh, essay. Very well done. Now, Glenn, you have a handful of other original manuscripts uh, in your I do. in your collection, I do. Why the decision to go with Black Peter as part of the BSI Press series? Oh, the straightforward answer is because that's the one I was asked to do. <laughs> okay, is, is it the one? Is it the one you would have chosen first? Oh no! Uh, well, the one I would have chosen first actually was already had already been done. The one I uh, would have chosen first is uh, the is the um, Dancing Men. Ah, and, and uh, that particular book was done uh, uh, before I was was able to add that manuscript to my collection. Uh, re- the reasons that that would have been my first choice is um, it's it's fi- it's it's physically one of the more interesting short story manuscripts. Yeah. I don't think it's the most interesting, but it's one of the most interesting. And as folks who know me know. My other passion is uh, codes and ciphers and cryptography. Yeah, and that's you know part of the title of this story, and it's really the only story in which a cipher appears. You know, holding up a lantern, you know, once for A and twice for B doesn't cut it for me as a, as a code. This is the one story that has an honest to god uh, cipher as part of a uh, cipher to be solved as part of the adventure. So that would have been my first choice, Got but it. it was done. I particularly like Black Peter because I, I, I do like the story. Honestly, it's, it's, uh, one of the best of the later, in my opinion, it's one of the, one of the best of the later stories. Um, this particular manuscript appealed to me as a, as a physical object because of the letter that accompanied it. Hmm. And the letter is, a, is a short note that reads to Mr. Collier. With best Christmas wishes, December 1908 from Martha Conan Doyle. So the literary agents thought enough of, of this story, of all the stories uh, in the uh, return, to make it a gift to his publisher. So that's Mr. Collier as in Collier's Magazine. Correct. I mean, it, it, uh, your, your, your listeners may recall that when Conan Doyle made the decision to uh, continue, I, will, I won't say bring Holmes back from the abyss, but I'll say continue the stories. He named an absolutely outrageous price for his uh, for these uh, works, in the pro- almost certainly in the hopes that he'd be turned down and therefore didn't wouldn't have to write the darn things. And the Collier's Magazine said, "Fine, we'll take it." And and in fact, and the and the Strand only followed after sh- shortly after accepting the business terms of writing the stories that subsequently became the return. No doubt that's why the uh, Collier's Magazine, not the Strand, are the first appearances of these, uh, of these stories it, by a month or two. Not dramatically, but nevertheless, uh, Collier's was the first to step up. Well, that's impressive. Now, what was the amount uh, that uh, Collier's agreed to pay Conan Doyle per story, do you recall? I'm afraid I don't. Well, we'll, we'll help you out. It, it was a thousand pounds per story. Well, it was a th- it was a thousand pounds per story, and and um, he only promised to write, uh, I think, five stories. He ended up, you know, writing, you know, Baker's dozen. Right. 
Um, but he only committed to, I, I think the number was five. And remember that a, 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 a decent, not a lavish, but a decent, uh, annual salary in those days was a couple of hundred pounds. He was, you know, he was asking, you know, five X a reasonable year's salary times five <laughs> for these rules. Yeah. Well, he was, you know, I've said this before, just in terms of popular culture, but he was like the J.K. Rowling of his day, you know, when she was at the yes, height of uh, Harry yes, Potter. That's, 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 uh, in a number of senses, I think an apt analogy, but there is one way in which it is not an apt analogy. He was reluctant every step of the way. Yes. Um, but, but other than that, a very apt analogy. Well, it's interesting in looking at the book to find out a bit about how Conan Doyle viewed this example of his own work. In Randall's essay about the manuscript and its history, we find out that when Conan Doyle had finished Black Peter, he wrote to Greenhouse Smith at the Strand and described uh, the story as rather Carpenter's work and felt it was not as good as his two two most recent tales. But, but the best part is that, uh, at least I think the best part, is he didn't, although he liked Sidney Paget's pictures for this new series of stories very much, he didn't like Paget's pictures for Black Peter, and in fact thought that the story needed a picture showing Black Peter with a harpoon through his chest. <laughs> well, you, you, don't, uh, don't forget, don't shortchange, don't overlook, uh, Conan Doyle's, uh, you know, gothic novel side. And it also shows that sensationalism was not beneath him. Oh no, not at all, not at all. So, not, I mean, not to sound jaded or something, but this is just another example of this other uh, other aspects of ACD. His his gothic novels are not well remembered, and very few of the Sherlockian events are you know violent, gory, etc. They they are there, but they the the stories are not replete with them. And with uh, Black Peter. Um, uh, Conan Doyle appeared to be in a particularly lurid, sensationalistic mood. <laughs> well, you're right. It's a big theme throughout a lot of Conan Doyle's work. You know, he felt driven to and loved recreating 17th century, 16th century England in his historical novels. But for his popular writing, um, he did things like blow up the world, discover a lost valley of the dinosaurs, write about coffins with secret compartments, the lost crown of the steward, spectral hounds, and here harpoons through the chest of a whaling captain. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, he knew what would sell. Through, through the chest and pinioning him to the wall. Yeah, I no, mean, no mean feat. Certainly, certainly a uh, uh, one could reasonably deduce that it was an extremely strong man who had done it, not, not a woman or, or, or some shrinking violet. Well, tell us, tell us a little bit about the, the manuscript itself. Now we've talked a little bit about it. Um, can you remember your feelings when you first held it in your hand? And, and how did it get to your hands? Well, it, it, it got, it got to my hands in a, you know, reasonably prosaic way that I, I bit, I bit on it at, a, on a, at an auction. And I was particularly interested in adding this manuscript to my collection. For the letter to Colliers that is, that was associated with it, my collection, collecting in general, in my collection, I I like things that embody a story that is other than the story that's written down on the pages, but be it a manuscript or a printed book. You know, if you want to read a, a Sherlock Holmes story, all but a couple now are in the public domain. You can you can download the PDF for free. If you prefer a book, you can buy a used Penguin for a couple of bucks. But the point, of, I think, the point of collecting in general, and certainly collecting holograph materials more specifically, are for the for the stories that they tell other than what's written on their pages. And the idea that this particular story so appealed in, in some way to Conan Doyle, it's the story he chose to give his, give, make a present of to his publisher. I am digging into that to see if there is something specific 
or th- what specific things can be, you know, deduced from that, inferred from that, gleaned from that. But I haven't come across it yet, but I will. It's a gray day in the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex when we remember the murder of George, Duke of Clarence, drowned by his evil brother on February 18th, 1478. But you need not fear because you enjoy Malmsey in moderation, especially when reading Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle in the newspapers, volume four, with a wealth of Sherlockian treasures from old crumbling newspapers from January through June 1894, when journalists remembered Sherlock Holmes after the Reichenbach and Conan Doyle promoted transatlantic friendship. Fade far away, dissolve and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret, here where men sit and hear each other groan. The perfect escape from a gray February day is a new book from the Wessex Press. Order yours today. Now, Glenn, a lot of times as a, as a collector of manuscripts, you can obviously make uh, inferences based on uh, what you see in the manuscript itself. Certainly the, the corrections, the edits, etc. And we know from history, from looking at other manuscripts, that first of all, Conan Doyle was an exceptionally uh, neat writer. His handwriting was uh, certainly atypical uh, in terms of medical types, um, but also that he very rarely made any major uh, redactions or uh, major edits. And, and looking at the Black Peter manuscript, uh, it seems like that is uh, almost quintessentially Conan Doyle in terms of having so few uh, edits. Can you comment on that compared with uh, what else is in your collection and what else that you've seen out there for other manuscripts? Yeah, I would I would say that th- that this story is um, a good example, an extreme example, if you will, of how close to the finished product the words that first emerged from his pen nib were. Um, and uh, it, it does it, it, it's it, it is superficially typical of his uh of his process of writing so to speak in that uh on these manuscripts occasionally you will see a change in edit as he was writing the story a great example of that is in the manuscript of the solitary cyclist where the character roaring jack woodley in fact was originally named uh turner and by Oh, I'm not qu- remembering exactly, but say by the sixth or seventh page of the, uh, of the, or eighth page of the manuscript, he went out, went back, crossed out the name, put in Woodley, and from that point forward, the character was named Woodley. More commonly, what you will see is that, um, he would make a, a, uh, second pass, or maybe third or fourth pass, uh, through the manuscripts, and make changes, and for those changes, he would invariably use pencil. So you tend to see two kinds of authorial edits, those as he was writing the tale, and those are are in in ink, and those after, uh, when he was proofing, rereading, whatever the tale, and those he did in pencil. And so in terms of the changes, if you'll forgive me the expression, the changes in real time (laughs) being in pen, and, and and as a as a post pass edit in pencil, the manuscript is absolutely typical. There are other there are other manuscripts. For example, the, mo- the most extreme example I know of it is the uh, Priory School, which has which has been produced as a as a facsimile edition, although well predating the uh, BSI manuscript series. But that one actually has pages where portion of the page were was were cut out. There are pages or, or half pages, I should say, where they were tipped in. And it's the coherence of the holograph manuscript through these missing chunks and through these added pages that uh, serves to, to show us that, no, it's not that somebody chomped out a bit to, you know, get a piece of his autograph writing or something, but that uh, that's the manuscript as 
Conan Doyle produced it and uh, uh, turned over to his publisher. Is there any evidence anywhere that uh, Conan Doyle had uh, kind of plotted out Black Peter elsewhere or had, uh, you know, kind of some sketch notes or something like that? I don't know of, ex- you know, except for the first story, Study in Scarlet, where the, 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 those uh, cherished scribbles and changes, uh, it's, 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 it's the only authorial material that, that we have for that story. Um, I don't think there is, is, uh, evidence of any, for any of the stories of, you know, outlines, gatherings of thoughts, et cetera. There, you know, there, for, uh, you know, an, an example of that is you look at the notebooks, for example, mm. that, uh, ACD kept, the Portsmouth notebooks or the Norwood notebooks. There, uh, e- each of those notebook sets has one notebook in it, which, uh, it, is a gathering of Conan Doyle's, you know, uh, ideas, thoughts, uh, for a plot or a story. It may, it may, it's often a sentence or two. Sometimes it's a paragraph or two. And, uh, in no case are these, do these, uh, presage, presage a Sherlockian tale. The other is if you, uh, but if you go to, uh, ACD's, uh, a life in letters, there's a letter where a house guest reports Conan Doyle as, you know, in his, in, in his office at his desk, simply writing out. It, it, I don't, rec- I don't think it what we know if it was a, a, a Sherlockian story, but nevertheless was simply writing out his story. Uh, and apparently also he, he did, he was able to do this in the middle of chaos, you know, with, with, you know, dogs running through the room and, and children screaming through the room and so on and so forth. <laughs> Uh, they, the, his stories show all kinds of evidence that they emerged fully formed from, you know, the mind of Zeus. That's amazing. Yeah, it, it's, it's staggering. Um, his other, his other, you know, his other stories, some of his historical novels and so forth, he does record in his notebooks substantial background reading, you know, the books he read and, and, and so forth. I'm a little shakier ground now because I, I don't know that there's directly any outlines or, or, or fragments for his, uh, historical novels in these notebooks, but there are substantial, uh, records of the, the background reading that he did. But that's not the, that's not the Sherlock stories. That's not the Challenger stories. Those were just emerged. Mm. Well, it's, it would be, it's a great area to learn more about. I think one of the mentions in Deadly Harpoon, it could be in Randall's essay. I mean, I remember seeing it somewhere where it's pointed out that he basically wrote Black Peter over a month, let's say. Yes. But for half, but for half the time, he was playing cricket. So for our listeners, you know, it's not really quite the case that he sort of sat down with blank paper and then four hours later stood up and said, well, that's done. I mean, he did this over a period of time what scrap paper he used, what outlines he might have had. I suppose the one thing we could infer about all that is whatever there was, he didn't think very much of and probably pitched it. Well, it's, it, it, it's always a possibility. You know, you, you, you can't prove that something doesn't exist. But it is it is remarkable that there is nothing for, you know, for, uh, well, there's the, again, there's the, with the study, there's the one page. But for the 60 stories, there's nothing. Nothing. So, but yeah, it's entirely possible. He, he may, he was certainly a, a disciplined and methodical man and he may have, you know, done that and then he crumbled it up and, you know, lit a fire with him. It's possible. Yeah. It's certainly possible. Yeah. Uh, but your other point, I, I perhaps I overstated. I didn't mean to imply that he said that he wrote these all in one go. Um, a month or two seems to be sort of, uh, sort of standard for him. You know, for, you know, just for, for example, it just comes to mind, you know, the sign of, uh, of, of four, a whole, a whole novel, uh, was what, seven weeks, I think, or eight weeks, wow. something like that. These, these, these book, these stories were done remarkably fast, but no, he didn't just sit down and, you know, straight write them, but he sat down and appeared just to write whatever chunk he was going to complete and go play cricket or something. You know, we know from his memoirs, too, that he was such a gifted storyteller when he was still, I guess, at 
his preparatory school or somewhere. There's something in Memories of Adv- and Adventures where he says on a, on a rainy half holiday, he would uh, be seated on top of a desk surrounded by a little group of younger boys. And he would con- tell over several days this continuing story about these characters that he would invent. And he would bring them into deadly peril and he could only, and then he would stop and he could only be got going again by pastry or by somebody giving him an apple. No, absolutely. That, that certainly appears in his uh, memories and adventures. This is autobiography. Uh, I mean, it's perfect. You know, I, I firmly believe that the two greatest storytellers known to us are uh, Mark Twain and Arthur Conan Doyle. Yeah. No, it's a great example, you know, particularly Twain, because Twain was so shaped by events in his life. And we were talking earlier about, you know, Barbara's essay about basically women in peril and mentioning what a continuing theme this is through the cases of Sherlock Holmes. You know, it's worth noting that Conan Doyle grew up largely in a fatherless house because his father was, you know, ill and not much of a terrific role model. His mother was... um you know, the great director of the family. And so he was certainly sensitive to her challenges. And then he had sisters, you know, and we've talked recently about them going off and being governesses and um, their challenges. And I I think of all of his sisters, only one, you know, married particularly well. And she married uh, Willie Hornung, who was another mystery writer. Yeah, absolutely. The um, Hornung was another mister. Absolutely. And, also a very warm friend of Conan Doyle's and also roughly the same age, fellow travelers through the world of, of letters uh, uh, during the era that they were both active. I think it's ironic that some of the very early American pirated editions are in fact Horning's books, which have a, uh, a Sherlockian short story tucked in the back of the book as added material. And in many, ca- in, in a number of cases, those are even the, uh, what are regarded as, if you will, the first book appearance. Yes, it wasn't the, ti- it wasn't the titled piece in the book, but it's, you know, in a book. It's not in a periodical. It's not in the Strand magazine. So, uh, the hyper accurate, hyper particular bibliographers will cite these as the first book appearances of ACD stories. And I just get a real kick out of the fact that they're in matter in in uh, Horning's work. Now, Glenn, uh, the thinking about uh, you know this manuscript specifically, uh, as we've been talking with respect to the other manuscripts that you own, um, when you first had a chance to to see it, and you know, obviously, we talked about the just the overall uh, state of the manuscript, its cleanliness, etc. Were there any surprises that particularly jumped out to you? Well, the first, yeah, the, the, actually the first surprise, in a sense, it wasn't a surprise. I knew this about the manuscript, but, but the surprise, uh, uh, what, uh, was unexpected is the other short stories, nearly all of them were done in exercise books. And this one was done on, you know, full, whatever they are, A4 sheets, the, you know, the, sort of longish European version of, of uh, uh, legal size. You know, why? I don't know why he did them on these individual leaves instead of uh, in an exercise book, but he did. And almost all of the other short story manuscripts are done in these, you know, very homely, very prosaic exercise books. One of the uh, one of the one of perhaps the consequence of that uh, is, of not being in an exercise book is uh, Conan Doyle didn't have it bound. You know, he he talks about this uh, by the binding, the, pre, uh, the presentation of his uh, manuscripts in a uh, letter that he uh, wrote in oh I'm not 1913 I think it was. I'm looking at that now. I uh, don't know who it was written to, and it didn't, and the letter does not have the envelope. Uh, so I don't know who the recipient was. But, uh, Conan Doyle says to, uh, his correspondent, your remarks about manuscripts are bearing fruit, and I'm having mine bound in vellum by spiels as to be ready for the, um, capricious 
American millionaire, which we all hope for but never see. Anyway, my own people would like to see them in tidy white coats. So um, the the exercise book manuscripts are in these white vellum, tidy white coats. Tidy whiteies. And, exactly. And and if you, uh, the, at, le- at least all the manuscripts I have seen, uh, the, the so bound manuscripts I've seen, do have in very, very tiny, tiny gold type in the, in the, uh, on just above the front end paper, uh, uh, you know, spiels. He really did do what he said. Yeah. And that, you know, certainly as someone who has collected parts of, um, uh, the Hound of the Baskervilles, which was, you know, scattered to all corners of the earth, uh, having the manuscript in, you know, a, a, uh, a, a, a previously bound, uh, book, an exercise book that, that probably makes it easier for collectors like you to track down and, and collect. Well, well, also the fact that they, they were bound, um, you know, it, it, uh, cer- certainly, um, uh, helps protect, helps ensure the, uh, uh, integrity of the manuscript. He did cite an extreme example where a, a, a conscious decision was uh, that the extreme example of the Hound of the Baskervilles, where a conscious decision was made to uh, break up the manuscript into leaves uh, uh, and use them for uh, promotional purposes. And I, no doubt, given the, given the very small number of, of leaves that uh, survive, you know, the, the booksellers who were blessed with uh, one of these man, uh, one of these leaves to put in their front window, you know, after they finished selling the book or the book, you know, ran its, the, the hound ran its course, I just crumbled it up and threw it away. Good Lord. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the interesting things we are reminded about in Deadly Harpoon is that for most of his life, Conan Doyle's practice as you've pointed out, was to write out his works in longhand and then send it off to a typist. And in this case, get back three copies, paying the typist, I guess, so much a word for the 8,900 words that he's scribbled on the manuscript. I'm curious, are any of those typescripts um, available in the hands of collectors? I don't recall reading or seeing much about those. That's that's a very interesting point. The only... Uh, I'm I'm not sure. Uh I do know that I have a couple of typescripts which were part of the um auction of um Conan Doyle effects in uh, I guess it was 2004 at Christie's where that you know large collection of stuff that had been living in a barrister's safe while the or solicitors I I don't know safe while the uh, heirs were uh figuring out who actually had uh, uh, rights to the material. Uh, there are a couple of uh, typescripts in there of one is one is one is an essay that that appeared in, in Black's magazine. And the other is uh, uh, something which will be a um, publishing project for me someday. It's a, uh, a typescript, which is a, a draft of a uh, play uh, unprinted play called the Stoner Manor Mystery. It's it's uh, clearly a, a, a first attempt, an early attempt at what subs- subsequently was uh, produced as as the play The Speckled Band. This pre- predates it by a little bit, and I find no no I've I have found no uh, evidence that it was ever published. Oh, interesting. And is this typed or is this in? This is a type script. This is a type script uh, with holograph cor- corrections. But it, it, se- it seems that uh, Doyle didn't f- figure it was up to snuff or something, and just did a did a, a second plate, clearly uh, uh, on on the same uh, subject matter, Cle- you know, s- cleverly called uh, the Speckled Band instead of the Stoner Manor Mystery. So those are two extant type scripts. I don't, I, I simply don't know if there are others. Well, the book is Deadly Harpoon, a facsimile of the original manuscript of Black Peter. Uh, it's edited by uh, Glenn Maranker. Annotations, commentary from uh, a number of Sherlockians who uh, have all contributed their 
a particular area of expertise to it. It is available from the BSI Press, which you can find at BakerStreetIrregulars.com. The cost is thirty nine ninety five. It is well worth it, and it is uh, it, it's it's uh, an expanded uh, size volume, so uh, it'll it'll go with. Uh, the other entries in the manuscript series that have been expanded to that size. It looks very handsome with the Frederick Dorr Steel illustration from the Collier's cover uh, as a dust jacket. Glenn, as always, it was a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, any any parting thoughts before we uh, we beg off? Well, no, I thank you very much. Uh, I uh, always enjoy chatting with you guys. It's uh, it's it stimulates uh, lots of thought, and um, I've got a pile of notes here of uh, at least half a dozen things of uh, pieces of homework to do as a, as as a result of our chat. <laughs> wow. Well, hey, sorry to put you to work. <laughs> no, you're not. I'm not. <laughs> no, you're not. Hell All right. No, well, no. just just keep in mind, uh, Glenn, that uh, Bert and I both have birthdays coming up uh, this spring. So, um, <laughs> if there's any spare manuscript you have lying around, we'd certainly be happy to uh, to take over their their uh, stewardship. Gentlemen, I have just the thing for your birthday. Really, seriously now. Oh. Uh, I am holding in my hand. Uh, I I received my copy. Oh, I don't know, Friday last or or Saturday last. Of the 1929 Sherlock Holmes film Der Hund von Baskerville. Ooh. This was a German film, silent film made in 1929, thought to have been lost. It was, uh, uh, a print, uh, incomplete print was, uh, found in, uh, the Polish film archive, FINA, and, uh, a, a group I uh, uh, am associated with that I work with that I love to death called the San Francisco Silent Film Society uh, restored the film and it is now available for purchase on Flickr Alley. That, that would make a hell of a good uh, birthday present for you guys. It would, Glenn, but I'm very sorry to tell you that I've already pre-ordered my copy from Flickr Alley. Oh, no, not, there's nothing to be sorry about. That's That's the right answer. Well, but that means you need to send me for my birthday, oh, I don't know, one of those Crowborough shopping lists that Conan Doyle would take to the market. You know, a <laughs> bottle of whiskey, pint of milk, things like that. Well, as always, Glenn, uh, it's, a, it's a treat having you with us. Thank you for uh, sharing your insights, your stories about your collection, and the wonderful direction of this, uh, this latest manuscript series, Entry Deadly Harpoon. Thank you. Well, I certainly appreciated um, <laughs> the, you know, I was thinking as we were, as we were listening <laughs> to Glenn, um, you know, how to capture all of this. I would say I had a whale of a good time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to say it. Oh. Somebody had. Well, despite your barbed comments, I had a whale uh, of a good time. Well, I, I'll tell you what. I will. Um, I will package up my remarks and I will send them to you. How's that? Oh, that's excellent. Message for you, sir. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> How pointed of you! Ah, oh, boy, <laughs> that's awfully rummy of you, Bert. Well, um, <laughs> yo ho, yo ho, me I know it's to me. It's always fascinating, uh, particularly with with someone like Glenn who has seen what near, not nearly everything, but has nearly seen it all, um, and and who has it all. Uh, it, it would seem, you know, Glenn. As, as I think about Glenn's collection and the manuscripts that he has been fortunate enough to acquire, he has four. Out of the 13 stories that are in The Return of Sherlock Holmes, it's just remarkable, uh, just from a, a collecting standpoint. For, first of all, that anyone uh, could get as many as four manuscripts, but that they all happen to be from the same collection. And how how wonderful a, a, a resource that is. And, of course, Glenn is, is more than willing to, uh, you know, to share his... Uh, collection with the public and, and through these publications like the BSI Press. 
Um, but, but being able to take that concentrated of a group of manuscripts and to look at the situation that Conan Doyle was in, to observe the differences in, uh, his, his approach to each manuscript, uh, the corrections, the notations, etc. cetera. Uh, it, it just becomes a, just a fascinating study for anyone who's interested in this kind of thing. Mm. Well, you know, but the, the nice thing too is that Glenn is really a great benefactor by being so open of this whole community. In fact, it's characteristic too of the, Sherlockian community, but also Glenn is just an interesting guy. I mean, if you think about all of his interests, the trench publications of World War I, which we've talked with him about over the years, coding, cryptography, systems, the Enigma machines, his support for things like the film restoration. By the way, while we were Talking to Glenn, or since when we finished that conversation, I went down to the mailbox, and what did I find? But I had received my copy of Der Hund von Baskerville in the mail from Flickr Alley, huh. which we had just talked to him about. So, uh, you know, his support for things like that and that restoration, lots of lots of contributions. And I can't believe that, um, you know, it's so many interesting things, so many of these interested, interesting Avenues of exploration, these subject matter, these, these related pursuits that we all have. Mm. It's a real characteristic of all of this. And I can't believe that goes on in other literary societies. Well, if it goes on in other literary societies, I don't know. I don't know where they are. Yeah. Well, we're fortunate that it goes on here and that we've got people like Glenn to contribute to that. Well, speaking of contributing, you know, we, we warned you early on in the show that we would be playing some of your voicemails that have been received here, uh, having recently figured out the uh, technical avenue for where where we might actually find them, where they reside. Uh, so that's good news. Uh, so we uh, just wanted to play a couple. This first one uh, actually goes all the way back to uh, November, uh, and it comes to us from Joe Baker. Joe, take it away. Yes, hi, this is uh, Joe Vega. I'm in Queens, New York, Regal Park specifically. I'm listening to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, I hose on a uh, podcast this Thanksgiving morning as I'm watching the uh, the parade. Um, and I heard your call, your call for um, uh, for voicemails. So I'm calling to uh, just to, to give my encouragement uh, to uh, to the podcast. I think it's great. I've been listening to it for years actually. And I look forward to, uh, to more years of, uh, I hear of Sherlock everywhere. And your opening, um, sequence is, is perfect and never changes. Uh, really, really great stuff. All right. Thank you. Oh, that's a great comment. And, uh, you know, probably while Joe was recording that message, while he was watching the Thanksgiving Day parade, he missed our float probably, <laughs> which is a real shame. Well, you know, maybe if we can, uh, if we can really up our fundraising game, we can get enough money for a float, uh, and invite, <laughs> you know, anyone who wants to ride it, uh, and, and carry little eye hose balloons, uh, alongside it, uh, and, and, and hold the ropes. You know, I mean, that's, that, that's the key part there is, you know, how are we going to get through, uh, you know, breezy downtown Manhattan or midtown Manhattan, uh, without helpers like that. So. Well, yeah, but it's sad to have missed the float last year because, you know, as you remember, we had Sir Ian McKellen and Christopher Plummer singing songs from Baker Street, which was really good. All the hot air you could want. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, uh, moving up to, uh, to present day, uh, we got this message recently from uh, Michael Bush. Hello, Burton Scott. This is Michael Bush, and... Uh wanted to continue a small conversation regarding uh, episode 160, the uh, adaptation episode. Uh, I did get around to uh, listening to the podcast, both of their shows, and uh, not not quite my cup of tea, but that's kind of irrelevant. I think uh, uh, Scott pointed that out. He showed that it was there. The criteria they establish is good. Their method of... Uh, expressing themselves not so much 
and their knowledge on homes not great, but the last two is irrelevant. You pretty much present what's out there and we'll draw our own conclusions. So I uh, thank you for the opportunity, and yes, I will go, but when they get around to reviewing the uh, more current uh, post uh, Victorian era adaptations, I probably will listen to them again. And I also suspect they'll outgrow some of their uh, issues. Gentlemen, have a, uh, have a good Valentine's and uh, Washington's birthday weekend. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Michael. That's great. Yeah. Well, and and I. I did hear from a number of people who had a, a variety of opinions about the adaptations episode. As you can imagine, it wasn't uh, to everyone's liking or they took issue with some of the uh, selections. And that's that's just fine. I mean, I think it was fairly well established, uh, certainly by Jeremy and Ariel, that uh, this is a matter of great subjectivity. And I think everyone brings their own lens to it. And, um, you know, we're just, we're glad that we got to have the conversation and that it continues to spark additional conversations with other people like Michael here. So, yes, well, you know, and it's, and you've pointed this out, you know, more frequently than I, but when your subject matter is Sherlock Holmes in popular culture, Really, there are no limits. I mean, I never, as we discussed um, in the adaptation episode, you know, it never would have occurred to me that this was a particular um, line of thought. But, you know, you and I are, are both pretty curious. And so, um, you know, when the subject comes up, you really just want to see what's going on here. And, you know, if you have these kinds of academic related interests in fiction and story development and how stories might change in different media and things like that. You know, um, I probably go off on those kind of tangents more than you do, but um, <laughs> it's fun. And who, and who knows what's next, you know? Right. That's the thing. You know, this kind of keeps us attuned to not the distant view. Hello, but uh, to what's coming next. And, and we'll talk about that in just a moment in our, news section uh, but just a reminder if you would like to join the ranks of joe and and michael and hear your voice on the air if you have something to add to the conversation uh, it could be about something you've seen or it could be about a reaction to something we've talked about please be in touch uh, there are a variety of ways to reach us as we said email us at comment at ihearofsherlock.com or leave us a voicemail at 774-221-READ, 774-221-7323. Well, that exciting, bounding music means that it's time to share with you some of the news that we've seen. Uh, one particular news item that came to my attention uh, recently is that uh, there has been a uh, an announcement that the pastiche series, Enola Holmes, uh, the Enola Holmes mysteries are being brought to the big screen. So those of you who are not familiar, the Enola Holmes mysteries, uh, it's a young adult fiction uh, series of uh, detective stories by Nancy Springer. Uh, and it concerns Enola Holmes, who happens to be uh, the 14 year old sister of Sherlock Holmes. Now, Sherlock Holmes is uh, her older brother, quite a bit older, actually, by a span of 20 years. And the Enola Holmes uh, series is uh, kind of your typical pastiche where it borrows from other characters that you will come across in the original Sherlock Holmes stories. But uh, there are uh, seven excuse me, six, uh, six mysteries out there right now. And they were, uh, I think the fifth one, the case of the cryptic crinoline, uh, as well. No, the first one as well, the case of the missing Marquess. Uh, both of those were nominated for Edgar awards for best juvenile mystery in 2007 and 2010. So as it turns out, the, the series has been optioned for a movie 
And uh, it, the movie is being brought to production and will be directed by, uh, looks like Harry Bradbeer and starring Millie Bobby Brown. Now, Millie is, uh, or Millie Bobby, I want to go with a more formal term, uh, is, uh, of course, known for her role in Stranger Things from uh, Netflix. Harry Broadbeer, I'm trying to think if I know any of his, he, he's a BAFTA winning director. Let's see. Oh, he's, he, he helmed the first and upcoming second season of the critically acclaimed series, Fleabag. <laughs> you know Fleabag, don't you, Bert? Yes, I had a lovely nap in one of those many years ago. But I scratched for a long while afterwards. Uh, but it it looks like they've got uh you know all kinds of uh resources that they're throwing at this and um and and it will uh enter into production in uh short order. Jack Thorne will adapt the script which is really uh, picking up on the uh, the very first of the uh, the novels. So again, you know, wonderful news here in terms of expanding the Sherlock Holmes universe and bringing in perhaps younger viewers and younger fans to uh, the base. The press is a very valuable institution if one knows how to use it. I must make something of it, although I've no doubt that every newspaper in London will be on the street with a full and detailed account. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. This is As We Go to Press with Matthias Bostrom. You know what? There's not a day without Sherlock Holmes in the news. So let's pick a date. Our random date generator gives us... May 19th, 1911, and we'll find a random headline from that day. Here we find Harper Advocate, Harper in Kansas, and a little article called Era of Sherlocking at Capitol. And that is an interesting word, Sherlocking. It had become popular around 1903, mostly in the United States, maybe as an effect of Gillette's play, and, of course, the return of Sherlock Holmes. The verb uh, to Sherlock means to deduce, solve, search. And now back to the article. First, there's an illustration with a man in the hat. Not a deer stalker. It's just a random hat. But he has a magnifying glass, and he says, Everything in this place needs investigating. And you can clearly see it's Washington. And the article reads, The era of investigation has begun in Washington and soon will affect every corner of the United States. I should say that this is a time, 1911, when the president in the United States was William Howard Taft, a Republican who had taken over after Teddy Roosevelt. And the article continues, It is impossible to walk around Washington without running across a Sherlock Holmes. There is no branch of the government too inconspicuous to escape attention. The Democrat microscope is being cleaned for use in matters ranging from the action of the president in mobilizing United States troops on the border of Mexico to the sanitary conditions in the public buildings. The article continues with various facts about what these investigations will be about. But we can conclude that there is always an era of Sherlocking at Capitol. There is always a Sherlock Holmes in Washington. All right, well, that music means it's time once again to play Canonical Couplets, our bi-weekly quiz that we have with you here on the show. If you recall, the last time around, we gave you this clue. When days grew dark for luckless Hector John, the woodpile shed its lurid light thereon. Bert, do you know which 
story, that couplet referred to. Oh, yes. That's that great tonsorial adventure, the adventure of the Norwood barber, isn't it? <laughs> Close. Close. You, you've got the right neighborhood. You've just got the wrong profession, as usual. Hey, uh, we are in Norwood, but we're looking for the Norwood Builder. The Norwood oh, Builder. so I don't know why I can't keep these things straight. I don't know. Well, you know, the, the the good news is you're not entirely off the map. You're just you're just uh, disoriented. Yeah, as usual. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we had a number of entries for that. Thank you, everyone who uh, who sent in an entry. We, we continue to see robust participation. So. Uh, as we do, let's spin the big prize wheel here and see what random number we come down to as it slows down and stops on number 11. Number 11, and that belongs to Jim Sosinski. Jim, congratulations to you. Uh, if you uh, get in touch with us, share your address, we'll, we'll reach back out to you as well. Uh, we will get you a prize from the IHO's vaults. And thank you to those listeners who are volunteering to send in uh, materials for us to add to the vaults that we can uh, then share with other Canonical Couplets winners. Well, here we are. Are we ready for the next installment of Canonical Couplets? All right. Here we go. A love triangle that ended in a tense altercation. One suffered death and another mutilation. If you know which story this comes from, send us an email at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. Put canonical couplet in the subject line. And if you are among the correct answers, we may choose you from the random generator. Good luck. Well, how appropriate for Valentine's Day that we should end with a cryptic couplet. <laughs> and, and, and a violent one at that, so it ties back into this episode. <laughs> well, I, I think that should uh, pretty much do it this time around. Oh, good. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> We've done about all the damage we can together. Yes. yes now I have to have. do the damage separately. Yes. And that means that I must be the separatist, Scott Monty. And I'm the all-inclusive Burt Walder. Ah, and together we say, The, the Game's, game's Your Foot. foot. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Game's A Foot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. Well, how appropriate for Valentine's Day that we should end with a cryptic, um, what do we call these things again? A couplet. <laughs> a couplet. All right, wait yes. a minute.